Welcome. Thanks so much for coming down tonight to this event on homelessness. My name is Professor Kim Nalder. I'm the director of the Project for an Informed Electorate here at Sacramento State. Uh, we are now located here in this building at the downtown, or Sacramento State downtown is what we're calling it. Uh, so we want to thank Sacramento State downtown for helping with the arrangements for this event, uh, for the College of Social Sciences and Interdisciplinary Studies, and also uh, the Department of Social Work for contributing to this event, and all of you for showing up today. I wanted to make an announcement about upcoming events that we have for the rest of this uh, fall for PI. So we have on uh, Wednesday of next week, October 17th, we have an event here in the same space at 6 p.m. on the Me Too movement in California. It's, you know, kind of a hot topic right now. I don't know if you know. Uh, so we have a political reporter, political scientist, um, people from uh, the lobbying industry, a whole range of uh, staffers. So a whole range of people who've been involved in this issue in California will be here to discuss that issue uh, t next Wednesday here at 6 p.m. And then we have an event on campus on fake news on October 24th. So it's a toolbox for how to arm yourself against fake news. And that is at 1.30 in the Hind Auditorium on campus. So those of you who are, who are students can come to that. And even if you're not, you can still come. There are some seats here kind of scattered around in the main area if people are struggling to find some place to sit. And then um, the week after the election, on the Tuesday after the election, November 13th, we're having a post-election roundup. So it's what the hell just happened, basically. Is we don't know what it will be yet, but we're sure that there's a hell in there somewhere. Um, and that's at 6 p.m. here as well. And you can have those same meatballs if you're loving those. Uh, so those events are coming up, and we would love to see you come back to those events here. This is our first pie event at this space. And we're very thrilled that it's filling up and we're excited to get to the content. So this is being recorded and we will post it online as soon as we're, you know, processed through it. And so you can watch it or share it with your friends and so forth. It'll be on the PI website. And one last promo, we had an initiative explainer last week with the legislative analyst office where the, the actual analysts who write the ballot pamphlet uh, analysis were there to describe what the ballot measures do. And we have the videos from that event available on the PI website as well. And so they're per initiative, so you can watch them five minutes or so each. So we encourage people to use those and share them with your friends. Yes? Project for an informed electorate. Sorry, I keep saying PI. It's a delicious dessert also. <laughs> so uh, uh, with no further ado, uh, let me introduce Dr. Susanna Curry, who will be the moderator, and she'll introduce the rest of the panel. So thank you. Hello, everyone. It's great to see such a great turnout. Um, welcome to the third event hosted by the Project for an Informed Electorate here at um, Sacramento State University. My name is Susanna Curry. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work at Sacramento State. Um, and I will be serving as the, a moderator for this evening's panel. Um, I'd li like to just first of all say how grateful we are that you've come, that you care about this issue, and that you've spent your evening with us here today. Um, and we are excited and proud to be here at, at Sac State Downtown, which just opened um, in August. Um, tonight we confront the various myths about homelessness. Now the issue of homelessness is of great local and regional, state, and national significance. And in our community, we've been seeing a real increase in homelessness. And this increase reflects a rise in homelessness more generally across the west coast of the United States. And these rates may be in part due to the rise in the cost of housing here in, in our area and in the context of stagnant wages. However, there are many other factors that are influencing this problem. And in fact, there is no one causal mechanism to homelessness. For every individual experiencing homelessness, there is a rich and complex story involving individual familial and structural influences. Ultimately, homelessness is, is a deep, deeply complex social problem that impacts the lives of thousands of people across the US. Even so, we do not agree on the definition of this important social issue. 
the causes of the problem, nor do we agree on the best way to effectively um, address homelessness. Inherent in this disagreement is the fact that our assumptions about what causes homelessness greatly impacts our prescribed solutions. Many of the assumptions we make as citizens are based on partial knowledge, too often linked to anecdotal evidence. Commonly, the true value of individual stories become warped and misrepresented and ultimately create simplistic understandings of homelessness. Therefore, tonight we have invited some key individuals and important leaders who have spent considerable amount of time thinking about and working around this issue from different perspectives. We would like to acknowledge um, the support of Dr. Kim Nalder and the Project for an Informed Electorate um, at the, and the Institute for Social Research at Sac State, the Scholars Strategy Network, and the National Homelessness Social Work Initiative. We, of course, also wish to thank the College of Health and Human Services and Division of Social Work at Sacramento State, and our colleagues Tyler Arguello and Patrick Bird for their support in organizing this event. Our goal of the evening is to engage in a conversation based on nonpartisan and evidence-based information and to acknowledge the efforts taking place in our community so that when we as voters make decisions about proposed solutions, we are making informed decisions. I'd also like to just acknowledge that we have some materials over on the, the table over there and please feel free to sign in um, as well. To start, I'd like to introduce our panelists one by one and then provide them each about 10 to 15 minutes to present, present some of their work individually. And then we'll have about five to 10 minutes for questions and answers um, immediately following each presentation. But um, if we run out of time, we'll have some larger discussion at the end of all the presentations um, as well. And the panelists will remain after the event um, if you have further ideas or wanna engage in more conversation. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Arturo Bayaki. He is an assistant professor, professor of social work at Sac State and a research fellow at the Institute for Social Research. He has over 10 years of experience conducting research projects in the community related to homelessness, mental health, and various social interventions. These include research projects that evaluate the efficacy of rapid rehousing and housing first programs, outreach interventions, and supportive services for indi individuals transitioning out of foster care, prison, and the military. Dr. Bayaki has also studied how communities broadly respond to these social issues. He has also consulted in the community with providers, local and state agencies, and a broad range of other stakeholders. Tonight, he will be introducing us to the issue of homelessness in our community and presenting some common facts and myths. So welcome, Dr. Bayaki. is if I know how to turn on the uh, projector, but uh, hopefully I do know how to do that. All right. Perfect. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction. And again, as Dr. Curry mentioned, we really appreciate everybody coming out uh, to engage with us in this conversation about homelessness. Um, I teach a lot, and so I feel like I always like to give my audience an idea of what I'm gonna be talking about. So I have a cheesy outline here about the four things I'm gonna talk about. Um, the first thing is really talking about some of the common questions I get about homelessness. When people hear that I study homelessness, I hear lots of questions, and it's a lot of recurring similar sets of questions and ideas that people uh, pose to me, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm gonna then share some of the research that I've started conducting here in Sacramento about public perceptions of homelessness. We commissioned a large survey uh, last spring asking people what do they think about homelessness, what is causing homelessness, and the types of programs and services that they would support. So I'll just briefly talk a little bit about some of those data points. And then um, 
what I always tell my students is that I try to teach three things every class. And so I'm going to test all of you at the end of the presentation. There'll be a, a little final that you have to take. And the three, and then my, so I'll leave it with three points and then uh, conclusions. So uh, often when I get questions about homelessness, uh, probably the first one that I get is what is the main reason people become homeless? And um, I was actually at a dinner the other night and a friend of mine kept asking me, um, so what is the main reason? Is it because of chemical dependency? Is it because people fleeing domestic violence? Is it because soldiers who have PTSD? Is it affordable housing? And it's yes to all of those, right? There is no single one question. Um, homelessness affects a pretty broad segment of Californians. And so, um, yes, all of those things are important. And often people want to know what is that one thing. And they get frustrated when I say that there isn't a one thing, um, that each individual is pretty unique, and so there is no thing that really cuts across everyone. What is causing the increase of homelessness in California? We've seen a surge in homelessness um, really in the last 20, 30 years, but in the last two years we've seen a pretty uh, significant uptick. And I'm sure all of us have seen um, viscerally uh, more people experiencing homelessness in the past. And so there's a lot of frustration about, well, why is that? Um, a simple answer is affordable housing, right? Um, we've seen um, rents skyrocket here in California. Um, currently, owning a house is two and a half times more expensive than it is anywhere else in the United States, and rents are about 50% more expensive. And what is the solution? Well, if the problems of homelessness are complex and everyone is unique, then there is no single solution as well. I also get asked about, is it true that most people have mental health issues, struggle with chemical addiction, um, come from out of town? And no to all of those. Um, it, all of these things are significant and important, and yes, mental health is a big component of it, but the majority of people who are experiencing homelessness tonight do not have a mental health issue or are struggling with chemical dependency and are not from out of town. The majority of people who experience homelessness are from our own community, and these are things that people have a hard time sometimes accepting, but the research is pretty clear on these facts. So let me talk a little bit about the survey that we conducted. Uh, we had 764 individuals across the eight regions uh, or eight counties surrounding Sacramento. And one of the things we asked is how big of a problem do you think homelessness is? And about seven out of ten people in the region think that homelessness is now one of the biggest problems that's facing our community. Uh, we asked how confident are you that the county or the city and our service providers can address this issue? And um, most people are actually pretty ambivalent about our ability to address homelessness currently kind of speaks to this almost growing fatalism about this growing social issue and what can we do about it. When we asked, why do you think we're seeing an increase of homelessness? One of the issues that we ask about is the lack of affordable housing. And Californians, or Northern Californians, were generally in agreement that affordable housing plays a role. And about half the survey respondents said that it's one of the main reasons why we're seeing a rise in homelessness. But we also saw about 50% who say that it's really about mental health, um, which, you know, it's uh, kind of interesting that Californians rate affordable housing and mental health kind of in a similar metric. Um, but then when we asked about, well, what do you think about people's personal decisions or the bad decisions that they've made in life? And there, people were much more in agreement to say that, well, if you're really going to push me, I do think that most people are making bad decisions or that they have a drug or an alcohol problem. And this is actually pretty consistent with the research literature that says that when we think about homelessness, we often try to blame the very individuals who are experiencing homelessness for their own homelessness. That is, we favor more individualistic explanations. It kind of fits our narrative that everybody is kind of master of their own destiny. So if you're homelessness, you must have done something wrong. So even though Californians are acknowledging that affordable housing is a big issue, um, we still kind of favor individualistic explanations. So what are my three points that I want to leave you guys with tonight? Oh, I see people taking notes. That's good. I was just joking about the test. There's no, no, no midterm test. So my three points are, one is California has the largest homeless population in the United States, and it's, it's growing. Uh, my second point that I'm going to make is that, again, there is no single explanation for homelessness. It's a complex issue. If you really want to drill down why we're seeing an increase, you'd have to probably say it's, it's a big role of affordable housing. 
And then the last point I want to make is that homelessness, I describe it more as a situation and less as a personal attribute. Um, but it's also a pretty fluid situation in that the majority of people who experience homelessness are actually straddling between being housing insecure and homeless themselves. And so that's actually a pretty big segment of um, the working poor in California. So here's some stats. You know, in a given night, um, it's estimated that in 2016, 118,000 Californians experience homelessness every night, right? It's the size of a large town or city of people just experiencing homelessness within a 24-hour period. Unfortunately, um, just last year alone, we saw about a 13% increase in that number. So right now, it's estimated that around 134,000 people in California experience homelessness every night. And as Dr. Curry was mentioning, uh, we're seeing kind of a surge in homelessness throughout the West Coast, not just here in Sacramento, but really in most communities on the western part of the state. One way to think about this, which is actually pretty dramatic, is that a quarter of all people experiencing homelessness are in California, right? So you think of everybody who experiences homelessness on a given night, it's about a million or half a, half a million people. A quarter of those individuals are here in Sacramento, or here in Sacramento, here in California. Um, half of all the people who are unsheltered, that is people who are sleeping outdoors and not sleeping uh, in a shelter or in a transitional housing program, uh, half of those people in the country are also in California. So we have the largest unsheltered population. We also have the largest percentage of people who are experiencing chronic forms of homelessness. So this is people who are homeless for over two years, which HUD kind of defines as um, people who are experiencing chronic bouts of homelessness. My second point is that homeless is complex, and so there's complex drivers. Uh, there is, you know, the pathway to homelessness is diverse and complex, and risk factors affect different people differently. Uh, there is no single profile of a homeless person. And researchers are more and more focusing less as an individual attribute and more as a situation that people experience. Um, of course, there are some individual risk factors that puts you at a higher risk of experiencing homelessness. And so if you grew up in poverty, that increases significantly your probability of experiencing homelessness. Your health and disability can be a predictor of homelessness. Yes, substance use can be a predictor. But one of the strongest things that researchers are pointing to is really the lack of social support that people may have uh, in terms of their family support or just their social networks. In the literature, researchers are also trying to de-emphasize this individualistic framework just because um, you may say that, well, it's the lack of social support, but just because you lack social support doesn't predict you're going to be homeless necessarily. And increasingly, researchers are trying to look at community and individual level factors at the same time. One of the strongest predictors of homelessness at a community level really is the median rent of a community. And the percentage of people who are, exp who are spending over 50% of their income on rent, that turns out to be a really strong predictor. Uh, researchers have also looked at poverty inequality. So in a state like California, Although we're a relatively rich state, we're also a very unequal state. And that inequality parallels our housing market, which in turn makes our housing very unaffordable for many people. And we've seen this kind of replicated in the research literature a couple times, that housing market conditions are the strongest predictors for various forms of homelessness. My last point I want to make is, again, the homeless situation. When people think about homelessness, they're often thinking about a person that they see downtown, somebody who has um, maybe uh, all their belongings with them. And those are the groups of folks that we really would categorize probably as chronically homeless, right? That they've been homeless for over two years, uh, and they've really ex experienced for that, that for a long time. The literature suggests, though, that that's actually a small percentage of people experiencing homelessness. And they constitute about 20% of people who are experiencing homelessness at any one time. Here in Sacramento, that number is a little bit larger. It's around more like 30%. And HUD defines these chronic homelessness as people who have experienced four or more episodes of homelessness uh, in the past three years. And these individuals do have more challenges. I mean, the longer that you are on the street, the more likely that you're going to experience all sorts of negative life events that might impact your health, you might impact your mental health. Um, but what I find interesting is that the majority of people who are experiencing homelessness 
are really in these two other groups that we call episodic homelessness or single event homelessness. So about 40, 35% of people are experiencing more generally uh, periods of housing instability, and they might just fall into homeless for a short period of time and then recover and become again housed or kind of straddling back and forth. And then about half of the people experience homelessness just experience it for a single event and never become homeless again. My point in all of this is that when you think about it, that 80% of people are really going back and forth, that yes, chronic homelessness is a big issue that our community faces, but I think especially here in California, it's really the episodic homeless and the single event homelessness that is kind of worrisome because you know, today's chronic homeless was yesterday's episodic homeless, which was the day before so single event homelessness. And so uh, housing prices really kind of prevents people from recovering from homeless quicker and to transitioning into a more stabilized situation. So my conclusions, um, just many communities in the West Coast are facing a, a homeless crisis right now. Um, it's a localized issue, it's a community issue. There's a lot of finger pointing that happens when we see homelessness rise, but it's actually something that's occurring throughout the state as well, uh, throughout the West Coast really. And when individual programs and communities are addressing the challenges of chronic homelessness, um, that number is growing, and the sheer, num sheer number of new individuals experiencing homelessness is likely exceeding the capacity of our programs. And we really have a triage approach to handling homelessness in this country and this state, where we really provide a lot of services once a person has become homeless for a while. Um, and there's considerable evidence that affordable housing could reduce just the number of people who become homeless every day. And so I see it as a kind of an upstream solution to many forms of homelessness. That's not necessarily the kind of earth-shattering, I think, conclusions that people look to me for, but and f that's the truth, that affordable housing is driving um, the rise in homelessness. If you really want to address this issue, then you really have to address this affordable housing issue. I know one of our speakers is going to talk about some of the propositions on the November ballot, and I think that will be an interesting place to carry on these conversations. So thank you. Okay. So if anybody has any questions, oh, could you come up to the microphone? Oh, I know. You can talk loudly as well. Oh, it's for the recorder. Sure. No, it's a great question. Um, you know, it depends on who you're talking to. HUD has a very strict definitions of homelessness, right? If you're staying in a place that's not for uh, human habitation, um, that could be a car, um, sleeping under a, a bridge, but it doesn't include um, sharing an apartment or couch surfing, right? And so when we do these official counts of homelessness, it's usually missing these uh, more kind of straddling conditions of homelessness. Mm -hmm. About, well, all groups are vulnerable to all of those homelessness uh, scenarios, uh, and some people are able to recover better than others. Um, all of them, I mean, a big group of them is really the working poor here in California, and I saw one study that suggests that 60% of all the working poor in California will at one point experience homelessness in their lifetime, which just suggests that that, that straddling group, right, even if it's a one-time deal, it could be a pretty traumatic event, and if you can't recover very fast enough, it can become episodic and in turn uh, chronic. Sure. I feel like I'm in a dissertation defense here. Hmm. 
That's a very interesting question. I haven't really thought about that, but I think the issue of pets is, um, you know, some people have pets on the streets because of safety, right? Some people have it for companionship. Uh, and some people know that they're more likely to get people to donate to them if they have a pet, right? Uh, unfortunately, like, some people feel sadder for the dog than the human being that has the dog, right? And, um, but the impacts that it has on on the pets themselves, that's a great, great question. Um, I know that there's some veteran services now that we that do outreach with folks who are experiencing homelessness. There's some shelters that actually allow um, pets to come in, and then you know the staff will walk the pets and and actually give give the pets uh, bathe the pets and so forth. So I think that's something that providers are addressing in pretty creative ways. Okay. And then I had a second question. Sorry for the questions. Oh, it's all um, good. So I know that the Department of Human Assistance has an online portal for their two shelters mm. where um, I believe they provide kennel services as well. Right. And then um, the Salvation Army is including their beds by a count of 10 for veterans. And I was wondering why, like, why don't we have funding to increase beds? Is it like resource-wise or the expenditures or... Like, why aren't we just increasing more resources? Yeah, no, I think that you have lots of great questions. I don't have really great responses to these. But um, recently the state is um, becoming uh, – playing a bigger role in, in investing in homeless services, and that's kind of some exi exciting developments that we're seeing here in California. Um, I'm curious to see what's going to happen at the federal level, to be honest with you, and um, if that funding will change in the near future. Um, but even with this increase in funding, there just isn't enough. Um, and, you know, there is this kind of effort to provide the right services to the right people at the right time, but there just are too many people for those services. And so, like I said, it's kind of a triage um, space that we're in right now where we can't provide enough housing. So, yes, we need more beds. We need more programs. Um, but the programs that are out there right now, they're just over capacity. I believe Proposition 1 or 2, um, if it's approved, a funding total of $4 billion will mm -hmm. go into um, assistance for veterans who are homeless. Yeah, yeah, Proposition 1, uh, it's for a bond measure, a $4 billion bond, bond measure, and some of it will go to help veterans do a down payment for an apartment. Some of it's going to go to build permit supportive housing, which we're in desperate need for, um, and some other things, yeah. Okay, and um, you should write a book. You're a really great speaker. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I, I paid her to say that, actually. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure we'll have some time for more questions uh, later, but I'll turn it back to Dr. Curry. Thank you. I'm sorry. Did you have a question? Sure. If you're talking about rent and leasing costs and such things yeah. that are increasing, um, it, do you have any information on, like, um, that's that's removing people from the rental markets mm. you know, because they can't afford it. So, are there are there populations that are coming in, you know, to to um, um, fill in those uh, those leases and rent, or is is our vacancy rates increasing because people are just priced out and there's not other yeah. people who can come in and say, oh, I can pay that. And right. No, I, it's, there is displacement going on where, and particularly from the Bay Area, where it's really unaffordable there, and it's relatively more affordable here in Sacramento. But as those people, those people, as people come in to our community uh, who can pay the higher rents, then, um, you know, it's a market-driven system, and um, – Renters find people who are willing to pay that rent, and so prices go up. But we are seeing a, a displacement uh, of people kind of being spread out from the Bay Area more and more to other communities like Sacramento. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baki. And there'll be more time to, to discuss these issues at the end of the panel, too, if, if you have some lingering questions. Um, now I'm going to be introducing Dr. Ware. Um, Chris Ware, PhD, is the manager of data analytics and research for Sacramento Steps Forward. 
He received a BA in government from Harvard University and an, a Master's of Public Policy and PhD in Public Policy from the University of California, Berkeley. In addition to his work at Sacramento Steps Forward, he lectures at the Goldman School of Public Policy at, at, at Berkeley, where he teaches courses on program evaluation and performance management. Dr. Ware has wide-ranging experience as a policy analyst and program evaluator. He has conducted major multi-year evaluations of a citizen participation reform in Los Angeles and Mayor Garcetti's initiative to introduce data-driven management into Los Angeles City Departments. Beyond teaching and conducting research at Berkeley and USC, he worked in the US Congress where he drafted amendments to the bill that became the 1996 Telecommunications Reform Act and worked as a research fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California. This evening, Dr. Ware will be discussing the use of data analytics to improve the effectiveness of homelessness programs. Welcome, Dr. Ware. Are we on this one or are we on the other one? Oh, but I need to. Let me see. Do I have a. Never mind. As long as I have a pointer, I'm good. Okay. Arturo has kind of laid out the scope of the problem that we're facing, and it is quite a grave um, problem. And I have the, the more optimistic uh, duty this afternoon to talk, not a solution, but a way towards a solution. And that's the use of data analytics and data in really trying to improve our ability to help people who are experiencing homelessness. Now, uh, you hear the buzzwords all the time. You hear big data, data analytics, predictive analytics. These are all methods of using data to, um, for business practices. Whenever you open up the, uh, the internet, you're constantly being bombarded by um, the results of that because they know exactly what advertisement that you want to see um, at that moment, or at least something that you have searched recently. What's interesting about um, the field of homelessness is that even though we're a government agency, we're actually catching up and we're becoming to have the capabilities to act like an Amazon. Back about 50, only 15 years ago did um, local homeless agencies start collecting data on the services that they were providing. This has turned into a national mandate with national standards and now it's, uh, we have typical, we have millions of records in the United States detailing how, how many people are experiencing homeless, how, what services they're receiving, and how well it's working for them. And we're just beginning to leverage all this information to really design more effective solutions. So the, um, just to kind of give you a perspective, to be on the negative side for a second, of why is this important? This is important because the resources that we're working with are so thin. If you look at the total US budget for homelessness in 2017, when you add up everything, um, that they provide, it's uh, almost $6 billion. They counted um, that same year about half a million people in the point of time count. That's leaving a budget, a national budget of about $10,000 for every single individual that's counted in a point in time count. A problem with this point in time count, that's a single night in the end of January. Um, people down in LA have modeled this and try to figure out how does this really work out to the number of people who experience homelessness over an entire year, and they came up with a factor of 2.7. So if you add in that 2.7, now we're only spending about $3,800 per homeless person in the United States. Now, the final thing that, that I'll add to this is that this is counting that all these point in time counts are accurate. This is an extremely difficult task of going out into a community and locating everyone who's experiencing homelessness. And people have tried to evaluate how accurate they are. And the best evaluations out there is that they're between 50% or just to just 7% under counts. So there's many more homeless people even in terms of the point in time count, which yet, yet again drives down the number of dollars. So anyone who's working in this field, the first thing that they need to be think about is how we make every single dollar count because we don't have very many of them. So the way to do this, as I, as I just described, is to take this trove of data and to analyze it and try to produce the best insights to drive our decision making to make sure that we can help the most people out in the community. 
The first thing what we can do is we can define the, the problem um, properly, just like a medical diagnosis, that um, my mother-in-law had a heart attack two months ago, and it wasn't diagnosed as a heart attack for two, for two whole months. So um, if, you're, if, you don't, if you're not defining the problem correctly, it's very hard to come up with a solution. Um, uh, other things that you can do is you can target the interventions to, um, to the people who need it most and who can most benefit from it. And third of all, you can use this data to continuously drive performance so that we're doing, we're doing better by the clients that we're trying to serve. So let me give you, some, an give you an idea from the data that we have here in Sacramento, the scale of this problem. These, the dark blue lines are showing us the number of people who came and asked for help in any single year. So in 2017, almost 12,000 people came and entered into our system and asked for some help. So that's, that, that is an enormous number. We were not able to help all of them, but in 2017, we successfully, the entire system successfully housed 5,800 individuals. That's quite an accomplishment, an accomplishment that is consistently underreported in the press. Taking a normal cost for having an individual experiencing homeless on the street for any single year is at least or on an average of $5,000. That means that housing 5,000 people is saving this city $30 million in police, hospital, mental health costs um, every, uh, every single year. Um, uh, as Arturo said, what, what, do, what do people who are experiencing homelessness in Sacramento say are their most important problems? And then again, what, what, what Arturo was saying is that really it comes down to poverty. Evictions are accounting for 10%. And then um, uh, financial reasons are a full third of the people who, um, who enter into our uh, homelessness crisis system. Drug abuse and mental health problems are certainly issues, but that they are, <coughs> they are um, significantly smaller issues than, um, uh, than the financial issues caused by eviction or, uh, or finances. Now, one of the things that you would like to know is that we, we, we are constantly discussing, well, um, all these things are changing. We believe our homelessness population is growing, <coughs> and there's lots of different possible reasons for it. And so the question is, is the, is the nature of the problem changing? And the interesting thing is that when you really look at, look at the data, there isn't all that much difference. It's on the right-hand side, for example, if you really thought it was a housing crisis, you would expect evictions to become a more important determinant of, uh, of homelessness, and it hasn't. It stayed, steady, it stayed pretty steady over the last four years. Similarly, with the opioid crisis, we, we could hypothesize that drug abuse would be, be increasing the um, cause of homelessness, but that's not what we're seeing from the, what, what people are declaring um, led them into homelessness when they, when they enter the system. There are some fairly disturbing um, uh, trends going on. The numbers are very small, but the number of very elderly people, 65 years and older and even 80 years of age and older, has been increasing over the last four years. We don't know exactly know what this problem, but very related to increasing rents, people living on a fixed income, it's a very dangerous e equation to be living under. Um, we've had the um, length of time that people have been homeless has been decreasing, but in, in this last year, we just saw a, uh, um, a, a bump up in there. So th this is something is that we, uh, if we're going to treat the problem, we need to actually define it correctly, and the data can give us a lot of information on that. What can we do to target these solutions? What this graph is showing, what are the costs imposed by an individual experiencing homelessness on, a lo on local governments. That means hospitals, the police, the criminal justice system, mental health facilities. And then these are the two top 250 people in Sacramento in 2015 and 2016. As you'll see, the average person in this, this very high user group was, w um, consumed $45,000 worth of services in a single year. So being able to identify those individuals and then provide them housing to get them off the street and stabilize them, not only is the right thing to do, it's the moral thing to do, but it also is a very cost effective in terms of the government fisc. Um, we see exactly the same thing when we look at homeless services. These are the number of people who either go into an emergency shelter or who enroll in street outreach, people who are literally homeless on the streets but start working with a caseworker on the streets. 
for the vast majority of these people over the last three years have only been enrolled in a program a single time. So they didn't repeat. That's a good sign. We don't want people go cycling in and out of homelessness. But then we have an, a large number of people that, that went, that came back two, three, four, five times. When you add that up, that's an entire 5% of the people entering into homelessness have cycled through the system multiple times. If we can come up with predictive analytic programs, uh, models that, en that enable us to identify these people the first time that they enter into a shelter, then we're able to tailor services to them to try to, try to keep them off the streets and get them into a permanent situation. People have been working on this model. Down in Los Angeles, they have built some, um, uh, s some models to, uh, to make these service predictions. And here's an, uh, an example of how important it can be. One of the models that they built to identify high cost users, um, people who frequently use, use police and, and uh, other hospitals, for the highest groups, the highest cost groups, they were able to do six and seven times, they were six or seven times more likely to identify someone who was gonna become a high cost user than just, uh, uh, than, than just choosing people ra uh, rapidly. Build, building these types of models can really very effectively um, identify services and find out the people who we, we can serve most cost effectively. Now the final thing we wanna do is we, we wanna constantly improve performance. Helping people who are experiencing homelessness is a very difficult task. I sit next to the room where all of our street outreach workers and they're constantly discussing their cases. These are people that have problems with drug addiction, um, uh, uh, they, haven't ha they, they, they don't have sources of income. All of their problems are very unique. And so it's very difficult to really tailor a solution for every, every single little individual. One of these things is that we can't come up with programs where one size fits all. We constantly have to be learning what's working best. The best way to do that is through data-driven management, and it's a very simple process. You take a metric, and here's a metric where I'm going is, is how many people, wh what's the odds of someone in a program actually exiting into a permanent housing situation? That's a success. So we have, we have a metric. What you want in data, to do in data-driven um, management is you wanna use that metric, you wanna look at all the agencies, how they're performing, identify the ones that are doing really well, identify the ones that are lagging, you wanna build on those successes and you wanna improve the ones that are lagging. And then you repeat that and you just repeat it again. And it's, it's a never ending process of trying to improve your performance, which is particularly important given that it's so ambiguous exactly what works in the homeless field. When you, when you chart this, all of this is showing, each one of these circles is showing what's the, what, what are the odds of someone entering this program actually getting into, uh, into permanent housing. There's a few really important takeaways um, fr uh, from doing this work. First of all, there's a number of programs. Oh, come on. Oh, okay. There's a number of programs that are, cl that are clearly doing much better than all of the other programs. And then there's another large set of programs down here that are the laggards. And so it's, it's very easy once you, once you do this analysis to start thinking about what's, what's going on. Um, well, on, on, on what are the success cases that you want to build on. Second thing you want to take into account is that there's a lot of uncertainty about how well these programs work. Each of these gray bars, for those of you who have taken statistics, is the confidence interval, and that's kind of the, a measure of the uncertainty about how well that program is performing. One of the things that you, you realize is that there's a big group of programs right there that, are all, that their, their performance levels are, are overlapping. For all of those programs, we don't have much evidence about one is working better than the other. So we, we don't, we, then we don't, we don't want to punish or reward programs if we really don't have any idea whether they're doing better or, or, um, or worse than another. The, um, the final thing to show is that I've calculated this using a model where I'm controlling for all the other factors. I'm controlling for how long was the person homeless, whether they were male, whether they have a disability, whether they're a veteran, everything that we know about the individual. It's incredibly important to do this because different programs um, serve different populations and then these can, uh, and, and the results flip all the time. So if you look at a program and it looks like it's doing great, it may be doing great 
because um, the program is very good or it may be doing great because it just happens to be attracting um, uh, clients that are there easier to house than other programs. While another program may be doing very poorly, but it's a program that focuses in on people with uh, very severe mental health issues, with drug addiction issues, and not surprisingly, they have a more difficult time um, housing people. Um, the most important thing um, uh, I will end with is that you get surprises. And when you do this type of analysis, sometimes something will pop out that's completely unexpected. And the, the thing that popped out for me is that um, there's two major programs that we, uh, it was basically that first touch. You can either enter an emergency shelter or you can have street outreach. My, my guess would be that you would be better off to get into an emergency shelter because you have a roof over your head and you have a bed to sleep on. But the street outreach programs as a whole increase your odds of getting permanent housed by 50%. Something is going on with w what we're doing with street outreach that very clearly we need to extend to our shelters. And that's, that is the type of insight that we need and we are in fact working on finding ways to extend that to, um, to the shelters. That's all I have. So, do you have any questions? I think the first statistic that you put out, you said that over $5 billion a year is spent in the United States on homelessness. Do you have a breakdown of the cost of that? From, from different programs? I um, uh, like I will, uh, for instance, enforcement, emergency room, um, the, housing no, the, care. Yeah, the, these down. are the, these are all federal programs that pay for um, permanent supportive housing and for shelters and for rapid rehousing programs. And so it can either come to a, um, a, a continuum of care like Sacramento Steps Forward, or it can go to the VA, or it can go directly to, um, to a number a number of cities. But these these are. Uh, th 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 these are programs that are, that are almost all for housing people who are homeless. Okay, so uh, I was just wanted specifics on that number. So that uh, okay, five I will, billion um, is about spent over on the United States for homelessness. Is a you're talking about money spent on programs for housing or programs of care? Can you just be a little bit more specific about that? That's that. Um, I actually have in my phone. Um, or, or if I can look it up at the, uh, the, the U U.S. Uh, Inter uh, Interagency Council on Homelessness, I'll look it up on their website. That's where I got the number. It, it, it broke it down completely by each each program type, um, but I don't I do not have the exact uh, the exact numbers for each program. Okay. So that's not perfect. Hi, um, thank you. I'm just curious, a lot of times when people talk about data and do, doing data analytics, um, there's, a, there's a laying out of, of a series of different facts. These could improve, that basically come up with, these could improve a series of programs. I'm wondering how you or other people that you work with, perhaps Sacramento Steps Forward, um, use data and then help policymakers kind of bridge the gap between how the data that are being produced and the recommendations that they suggest and then how those recommendations are taken and used to better the programs um, that originally these questions were asked for. And I, it's just a, tends okay. to be a bit of a black box that let I'm curious about in this particular setting. Okay, l l let, me, let me give you an example of something that we have been working on. So one of the forms of, uh, one of the major programs that we have here in Sacramento is called Rapid Rehousing. So it is a, a voucher-based program, so if you, if you're homeless, you can get a voucher and a, a number of services that are, um, and the goal is to rapidly get back into your feet, on your feet, and within two years, you're able to um, uh, maintain your apartment on your own, okay? That program has been, um, the success rate of that program has been collapsing over the last couple of years. We were getting 90% of the people were successfully rehoused in 2015, and now it's, and now it's less than 50%. So we have, a, we, we have a rapid rehousing collaborative, and I did a very similar analysis um, to this on who is doing well and who's doing less well in rapid rehousing. And we were able to identify that there was one agency that had an incredibly strong success record. 
And so then the way that you, 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 you go there is like, well, that, that, that's a good finding, but we, that, 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 that's telling you what is going on, but not how it's going on. And so then we brought, we brought all the, the case managers together and we were, we were having a, a discussion on what are they doing in terms of case management and getting people uh, into these houses that's potentially leading to that success. And that's the way that you need to be working through this. Um, so it's an entire process of um, identifying successes, then digging deeper into figuring out what's behind that, that improved performance and seeing whether you can get other, other agencies to, uh, um, to implement those ideas. Thank you. Short hand. So I heard you talk a lot about like issues with the indi homeless individuals themselves, but does your data look into, um, I guess maybe like discrimination or microaggressions towards the homelessness and how that impacts the program's like, I guess, success? We, um, you know, uh, uh, a, a really important issue on, uh, on data is that you need to understand what you actually have information on and then there are many questions that you don't. So if you're speaking about microaggressions that occur on the street, um, uh, that is, th that is uh, we do not have data on that. And that would be, that would be an, a, an interesting um, uh, thing to look at, uh, into. Um, one, of the, one of the constraints that we have and one of the remarks that we get when we talk to all our providers who are collecting this data mm -hmm. is that if you're an individual experiencing homelessness, you may be asked <coughs> a long series of questions multiple times during your, the, during your program existence and they get tired. Mm -hmm. So we, there's always a balance that we need to collect information, but we don't want to be burdening people and, and making getting help a real, a real burden on them. So we have not been asking uh, uh, them about that question, but um, I, I will consider it. <laughs> <coughs> yes. So I'm pretty stunned by your 50% um, people who use the outreach team are how ha um, are permanently housed. So my question to you is: Do you find that there are cities that? discourage outreach teams as a means of um, maybe discouraging the whole homelessness population in that city. And specifically, mm -hmm. I'm talking about West Sacramento. <laughs> 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 because I, I'm not finding any sort of assistance in West Sacramento, whereas Sacramento is very rich and Woodland and Davis are a little better. Um. There is a, I, I would put it, um, l l let me answer it in the opposite. There are cities that are much more um, aggressive towards actually making sure that they have an outreach team um, operating in their city. I think that um, we are working as a COC understanding that this is a very successful model that uh, as Arturo pointed out, there is more st um, uh, state money coming into our uh, uh, coming into our community, and one of the ways is to think about ways to improve and expand the way that we are using that type of street outreach because it has been a successful model. But uh, I just heard that West Sacramento doesn't really want street outreach there. Uh, I, I and, get to I get to plead ignorance because West Sacramento is in Yolo County. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and th that's okay. But, um, I'm just opening up that discussion for my knowledge for work. The um, I think that uh, there are two um, parts of this equation, and th uh, in that. There are your goals as a community and as individuals when it relates to people who are experiencing homelessness. Those are a set of, those are a set of values. And then given, based on those values, then I we can use that data, data to see how well and what you can do to, um, uh, uh, <coughs> if, if you really want to improve the situation, how best to do it. But if the values are that, um, and the community is not does not have a strong interest in defining this as a problem, and devoting resources to it, the data can do can do very um, can do much less for you, because the, the, uh, the, the data does not determine your values. It only can tell you how well you can fix a problem, knowing what your goals are. Thank you. So, um, 
So UC Berkeley has a um, MSW program that's more focused on policy. And um, do you teach at Berkeley right now? The, 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 I, I do. The program that I does, does doesn't have a joint, um, jo the, a joint degree with the MSW. But I actually okay. know um, uh, when I went to Berkeley and got my master's degree, there was about 10 people who did get their um, joint MSWs and, uh, and public policy degrees from Berkeley. It's a great program, and several of them work, guess what, in homelessness policy up here in Sacramento. So, uh, um, And then for Sacramento Steps Forward, do they conduct um, VSPA assessments? Uh, yes, everyone, we, we do, but it's really, it's a community-wide as, um, assessment. So the idea mm -hmm. would be that everyone, every um, uh, uh, every outreach worker, every emergency shelter worker, everyone who comes in contact with an individual experiencing homelessness at some point wants to give someone, uh, and, and what she's referring to is just an assessment. And just as it's an assessment of, of, of an individual's vulnerability and to try to triage them into different types of care. So it's a very important assessment, if for no other reason, is that you need to have that assessment to be eligible for an, um, to be um, included in a number of programs. So we, we do try to get those people um, into assessments. One of the things that in this, in this analysis showed, oh, I didn't. I don't know where I, uh, my, my results went, but uh, the, having an assessment greatly increases the odds that you will actually have a successful outcome. So, that the, the, so uh, th this idea that we really want to work harder in making sure that everyone who enters into homelessness do does have access to this assessment is an important part of the entire program. Okay. One of the constraints, though, is, is we never – it's a very intrusive assessment. It's asking you questions that you would feel are, are very private and you wouldn't necessarily want to share with someone else. So a little bit of a consideration is that you want to have a rapport with someone and they, they need to feel comfortable with you before you start asking them questions about their drug abuse and, and, and their, their different disabilities. So it's not necessarily done the first the f right away, but only after we really have a relationship with an individual. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, and again, we'll have some more time at the end um, to ask more questions. So now I'm going to introduce Dr. Ethan Evans. Um, he has nearly 20 years of experience in direct social service delivery, program management, academic research, and policy analysis. From 2002 to 2007, he served as executive director to the Sacramento Housing Alliance, leading a successful campaign for inclusionary housing in Sacramento County. Afterward, he was awarded a German Chancellor's Fellowship to compare approaches to addressing homelessness internationally. Dr. Evans is beginning his first semester as assistant professor in the Division of Social Work at Sacramento State, and we're glad to have him. And tonight, we will outline provisions of, um, he will outline several, provisions of several ballot initiatives related to housing and other issues that may influence the course of homelessness in California. So welcome, Dr. Evans. I'll be turning you around in just a second. Hey, great. It's nice to be here today. It is also great to follow really excellent work by uh, colleagues, Dr. Biaki and Dr. Ware. I mean, to hear what they've put together, specifically some things that we don't always recognize, which is what's working, right? And so how many people out here have been involved with the social service network in Sacramento County? So show of hands. Thank you. It's hard work. And uh, how many people are students here? Thank you. You work hard. Your engagement in the classroom and your demonstration of engagement by coming here is important. It's very important. It's also very exciting. So welcome here. Good to see you. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about some ballot initiatives. This means you can have a voice and you can vote on. 
If you haven't registered, you can do that by October 21st. You go to the Secretary of State's website, you click on a few buttons, and you become registered to vote. And in California, anytime you touch the DMV or the federal or the post office for a change of address, you're, you are opted into registering to vote, which is kind of unique. We encourage people to register to vote in this state. Please do. It's your entrance exam to be able to participate in one component of democracy and citizenship, and that's important. Oh yeah, that doesn't work. So there are a number of propositions on the ballot. These happen because of a couple of processes. Either the reality is a bunch of people got paid to stand outside supermarkets and collect signatures. And when enough signatures that are certified by voters are collected, it ends up on the ballot and we get to vote on it. Or the legislature passes something that they'd like to encourage the citizens to decide rather than them making a specific decision about an issue. Sometimes that's politically easier for them. So that's another way that ballot or propositions get on the ballot. And there are also local initiatives that happen through a variety of ways, too, that are similar to the statewide. So tonight I'm just going to quickly talk about four statewide ballot initiatives. That means every voter in the state will get a chance to vote on them. And one local initiative, which means if you're a registered voter in the city of Sacramento, you will get a chance to vote on. The first one is Proposition 1, and this is directly related to what we've been talking about. It's called the Affordable Housing and Veteran Housing Bond Act. Someone in our audience mentioned it already. We have a state infrastructure through the State Department of Housing and Community Development. They have many programs that fund different types of development and support for affordable housing, homeless services, emergency shelter, and the like. And this is a bond measure that will provide money to continue to fund some of those programs. And as we talked about, in California, home prices are high. But so when someone say 2.5, the national average, and rents are high. Also about 50% <coughs> higher than most of the other country. And in some jurisdictions, some cities, you know, it can be double, right? Go to San Francisco, it's double anywhere in the country, right? So we need to figure out some ways to build housing that's affordable at specified levels. The market does not do that without assistance from funding from state and other agencies and programs. So this bond will authorize $4 billion. I would explain the bond process to you, but it's complicated and I don't understand it. <laughs> Basically, make I think we make IOUs as a state. We give out the money to people to do things with it. And then we pay it back like we were paying a loan over time. So this $4 billion, I think, will actually cost us $5.9 billion over, I think, 30 years. That money is going to go, if you get these slides, there's an embedded link to the Department of Housing and Community Development. And you can see the lists of programs with program descriptions of where that money will get spent. But in general, it will be spent this way. 1.8 billion are going to go to multi-family housing programs, building apartments that have regulated rent caps, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Infrastructure programs that help build the infrastructure to improve housing and communities, maybe building sidewalks so that people can actually walk to the bus station and not slug through weeds. Right? Home ownership programs, 4. Uh, or 450 million. A farm, farm worker housing program. A lot of farm workers, transient farm workers. So the state finances housing development so that they have a place to live while they're picking the valuable produce that this state produces. And veteran home loans, one billion. That's why they got their name in the title. Billion bucks is a lot of money. This is what it's supposed to produce. We think about 30 million multifamily, or excuse me, 30,000 multifamily units across the state. 7,500 farm worker units, 15,000 home buyers will receive some sort of assistance with a loan, and 30,000 veterans will receive home loans. It's a lot of people, it helps a lot. 
It will not solve the problem, especially dispersed statewide. To, somebody asked about rental um, vacancy rates. Vacancy rates are not opening up. There are people moving here to fill the more expensive apartments. So we're not having a glut. If we were having a glut of open apartments, the prices would come down. But we're not because we're not building housing to keep up with the demand. And to get above that amount, you have, I mean, let's say we would have to do those 30,000 units here in the Sacramento region over the next six years to really push rental rates down and have a serious impact in cost. But that's statewide. Um, but who is this housing for? That's an important question, right? And so there's a rubric at the, at the state government that sets housing uh, income limits. And they have categories of income, extremely low, very low, low, median income, and moderate. These are uh, official designations based on the median income. An extremely low income individual is an, in, is an individual who makes 50% of the median income, really poor, $16,850 a year, okay? A family who's extremely low income also makes 50 or 50% of the median income and they earn $25,000 a year. Hard to make it on $25,000 a year. Nearly impossible to afford a rent if a rent were $1,000, that's half your income, gone, right? Up through these other income categories. I don't know the percentages of the programs that will be funded and which categories they will fund, but I can tell you that a lot of them will be down here. They will, it's, it's not, it should be recognized that not all of that housing will be built for homeless people. They will be too poor for a lot of the housing that gets built by this money. That doesn't make it unnecessary or a negative thing. It's a reality of these programs. And it's also a reality that a family making $64,000 a year, let's say it's two adults and two children, is having a hard time here in Sacramento to afford housing, to keep groceries on the table, to cart their kids back and forth to school. And so those are necessary workforce housing programs. You, know, you can imagine a family of two working at the state and bringing home between that 64 and $96,000 a year. So these are, not, these are not families that a lot of people fear they might be. These are you and me who will receive assistance through programs like this. Let's move on to Prop 2, another housing funding mechanism, this time targeted. Huh? Nope, wrong way. Proposition 2, same type of mechanism. We're going to do some sort of loan thing where we bring in money, give it out, and do IOUs and pay it back. This time, we're going to focus the housing on existing mental illness, or individuals with mental illness. And it's, a, it's a strange technicality that this initiative is. We already voted to tax millionaires to fund mental health services in this state. It's called Proposition 63. It was uh, initiated and spearheaded by our current mayor, but then a, I think, senator for the state. And it passed. So we've been taxing millionaires to pay for mental health services. But part of that act did not pay for any housing. And we know that if you can house people, like Chris mentioned earlier, if you can house people, it's less expensive and the outcomes are superior. And so what this initiative does is allows the state to use some of that money to bond against and build housing with it. Okay. So it's, it's a finite technicality in the law, but it opens the spigot to use an existing pool of money towards housing that will be designated specifically to people who are lower income than some of the other funding programs that will be funded from the other proposition. Proposition five, the property tax initiative, transfer initiative. 
How this relates to homelessness is interesting. The impact of it is it's going to, it could affect revenues to counties and schools. Because currently under Proposition 13, some homeowners whose property tax only goes up if they sell their house can transfer their savings, their low property tax bill, to a new house if they buy one. So they can move and take their low taxes with them. But it's limited. They have to live, move within the same county. They have to move to a home of equal or lesser value. And they can only do this once. So this proposition would remove those restrictions. So now people could move to anywhere in the state. They could move to a home that's more expensive and take a tax rebate with them. And they could use it more than once. Okay. So this is a, um, an opening up of a tax savings for a population, particularly 55 and over. I think the rationale is because, you know, when you're up, w at some point in age, your income doesn't go up. So if your property tax is going up year after year, at some point you can't afford your property tax because your income has pegged standard. So it, there is a benefit for this program. Let's not forget that fact. But there's a significant cost to expanding it. The estimate is that uh, 85,000 home buyers a year could take advantage of this program. And that would reduce tax revenues. Municipalities and special districts in the first two years, the uh, legislative and analyst office suggests that about a million dollars per year. The same for schools. And then as this is done year over year over year, it becomes billions of dollars each year. So it has a significant cost. Now that's not a direct housing hit to homeless people, but it is a revenue source that cities and counties who are responsible for homeless services, counties particularly, will not have within their general budgets to allocate towards services. And it doesn't mean that they would but it should be thought about, it can be thought about in terms of the topic for tonight. And then finally, there's a local rent control initiative, Proposition 10, which currently under a thing called Costa Hawken, rent control or rent stabilization ordinances that are passed at the city level typically cannot be applied according to this state stipulation to single family homes homes built after February 1st, 1985, or um, when a landlord transfers tenants, somebody moves out, somebody new moves in, a county or a city is not allowed to limit how much of a rent increase that land property owner can put onto that new tenant, okay? So what this initiative would do is repeal that cost to Hawkins and if passed, cities and counties could adopt rent control or stabilization or ordinances that apply in the mentioned ways, right? So it could open up more places to make stipulations about what landlords can do in terms of rent increases, okay? Impacts, potentially, I mean, the way the state thinks of things is will this cost us more money? And potentially it could cost more money because it's about property values. And if you can charge less rent for your property, your property value goes down. So if a lot of cities and counties adopt new rent control ordinances, it's possible that that would reduce property values and reduce the income to those cities. But if nobody adopts anything, then there's no cost. The benefit side's harder to calculate because we don't know what it would do to stabilizing rates, rents, and we don't know how that would open up opportunities for lower income people to stay in, their, in place or afford the places they are. So it's a lot of uncertainty. But it, op it op opens up the possibility for those types of local experiments and initiatives around rent stabilization as one mechanism of addressing the housing crisis. But it's again a technicality thing. This is a legal stipulation, so it doesn't have a direct immediate impact for homeless people who we're concerned with tonight. And then locally, there's something called Measure U, 
currently there's a half cent sales tax on everything you buy in the city, I think, city of, Ta of Sacramento. And it's gonna expire in March, 2019. So led by the mayor and I'm sure others who support this initiative, there is a proposal for a one cent sales tax. That means increasing the measure you tax by another half a cent. And the expected impact is that it would raise about $95 million per year to the general fund of the city. Here's the tricky part. So the measure you fact see says that this will help to maintain and enhance city services, including public safety and allowing the city to invest in youth, affordable housing and inclusive economic development. The challenge is Measure U is a general tax. The revenue it produces would be deposited in the city, city's general fund and it may be used for any municipal purpose. More money for the city. There's an intention of where it should go and there's nothing that stipulates where it has to go. The city could use more money to do these things, that's for sure. We just talked about the problem. Chris illustrated it, Arturo illustrated it. Um, I have heard the mayor say, I have a track record for producing results in the way that I say I will produce results. This is the way that the fact sheet says that results will be produced. That is a possibility. So it's important to sort of find out any a measure that's passed needs to go through a legal review. That's one of the challenges of this proposition process. And implementation of anything new is fraught with problems. So it's important that we as engaged citizens who understand these initiatives, who have voted for them, continue to work with state officials and our elected local officials to ensure that the things that are done are done in the way that we'd like to see them done. So I really, I'm excited about this coming election in terms of our topic tonight. There are some real initiatives that people can get behind that will make a difference. Where, how, to what extent is always the question. But we do not have to feel powerless in the, in the moment that we're in. And as others have mentioned, this community specifically is doing amazing things in terms of homeless services, in terms of attention, in terms of increased resources. I think our federal poll for resources for homelessness, somebody asked about that $5 billion, has increased year after year. And that's because of the dedicated folks, some of who are here tonight, that have continued to show that we do a good job. And so the federal government continues to up, up our purse to continue to do a good job. So I invite any questions. I also uh, encourage you to do your civic duty and vote on November the 6th. interesting to me because in theory I think a lot of people are in agreement with rent control but current polls show that it is generally not being approved especially in major metro areas mm -hmm. and I was hoping you might expand upon some of the reasons you think that could be based on what you do know about it um, like LA and SF specifically have higher rates of people saying they would not vote to approve Prop 10 I mean it's a contentious issue right it's gonna cost somebody money Right? Because if rents aren't charged at a higher rate, somebody loses money, so that makes it contentious. Then there's the question, does that benefit people who need housing broadly? And I think the jury is out. I mean, I don't know the research enough to say definitively this is the strategy to go forward. What I can say, is, and so cities are, it's hard to pass these things. So where they are passed, it is through a tremendous community effort, usually led through grassroots organizing. And so for example, here in Sacramento, what you will not see is a rent control ordinance on the in ballot this year. Even though a community effort was led over the summer to gather si uh, signatures to put a rent control measure on the Sacramento city ballot, they've decided to wait and not, and they were successful in getting the number of success, uh, signatures, which is no easy task. And they decided to wait until 2020 to put that initiative on the ballot. 
And so it's possible that our community will have that discussion. And you'll see the arguments that get made on both sides. Um, the cities where it's been done, I don't know how many have reversed it, but is it the, it's not the only thing that needs to be done, that's for sure, or that I would stand behind as an opinion. And what I can also say is that it's my opinion that no amount of development and these funding initiatives, no supply side approach is gonna do the job that needs done for a lot of reasons. The target's too high, it's not enough, and it takes too long. And so for the, for, I was buying some stuff on Craigslist because I just moved, and I came to a woman's house who had a hutch, and, uh, and we got to talking. She was selling her stuff because she, the place she was living for four years, she's being thrown out. And because they're gonna raise the rent by $300. And she doesn't have $300. And it's in their legal right to do that. And why are they going to do that? Because somebody else will pay it. And uh, she has no recourse. Zero. And she's trying to find a place. And I don't know if she's found a place yet. We stayed in a little bit of communication. None of those supply side things are going to help that person I met. A rent stabilization control might could in the immediate term, depending on how it was written. But then the question is, what are the consequences? Because there's always winners and losers. And so it, it becomes a question, what are the consequences if we restrict the rental market in some way? Because we do need to build, but we need to build at the tune of 10 and 15,000 units, not 200 you know, next to a light rail spot that, uh, that are gonna be, what's, Fremont Muse, I went over there, one bedroom on the flat, $2,200 after you buy a parking spot. I asked, are there any, what sort of amenities should I know about? They said, oh, we don't really have amenities. Woo, it's a lot of money. So thanks for the question and that's what I can do with it. Sorry for asking so many questions. Um, so I'm curious um, to learn where the funding is coming from. Like, would it mainly be taxes? And where is it taking away from? Like, would it take away in terms of employment funding and um, w what its effect on SHRA, on schools, on student loans? Like, just the <laughs> whole, like, concept, like the whole global concept of each department, right. if these propositions are approved and then the whole like terms of us going further into debt and so all these loans. So my students today from the social welfare 150 class will know that I'm concerned about an attitude that speaks of scarcity. That we're always in a zero sum game. That the reason we don't solve these problems is because we don't have the money. I don't, I don't buy it. We have the money. We allocate it foolishly. We concentrate wealth in places in extreme ways. So I don't, so your question was, well, if we do this, do we lose it here? And I don't think that that's the way things work, except we believe that's the way things work. So that's the best answer I can do for you now. The time is at where we need to be, and I'm gonna turn it back to our moderator. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I thought what we'd do next is just have about, we'll start with about 10 minutes where each of our panelists can sit, um, come up here and we can maybe have a more of a, a conversation. Um, and uh, again, if you could come up to the, um, up to the microphone to ask a question. And this can be a question maybe posed to one individual or it can be a question posed to all three or a set of panelists. Um, so I'll go ahead and open up the floor to anyone that would like to pose the first question to our panelists. Great, thank you. 
This is a question I meant to ask previously, but uh, is, doesn't the Sacramento Housing Alliance have some good information on their website? Uh, yes. Okay, so <laughs> that's where I would refer some people to. The other thing is UCLA Lewis Center um, has done some research and, and put on some webinars about rent control history in Santa Monica, which might be worth looking at too. I'm just throwing that on there. And there is a, there is, that's a great point. Yeah. The, the, the rent control questions, there's a lot of information out there. There will be a lot of opinion pieces as well, or you know, this is gonna be a political campaign, yeah, so it'll be hard to decipher. And I, I, it's hard to decipher. I'm torn as well in finding that information. Those are great resources. Yeah, I thought so. Mm -hmm. So this is for anyone. Um, we've talked about building housing as maybe one of the best things we can do. What about NIMBY? Hmm. How do we deal with people? That's one thing like no one's really touched on, and that seems to be the biggest ben uh, barrier, in my opinion, to building. Like, it's great. We have rent control. It's great. We have funding to build housing. Everyone has the best intentions. Execution doesn't always go that well. What do we do with attitudes? No, I think that's a great point. And I think uh, Ethan was highlighting that when you're talking about Measure U, you know, raising funds for affordable housing. There are funds for affordable housing. Communities just don't want to build them. And city councils don't want to approve them. There's really no um, political win for them because of nimbyism, right? Like you're going to build affordable housing in my community or in my block. Um, and so we, there is kind of a lack of a political will to build affordable housing, which is connected to the homelessness issue. Um, but I will say that, like, the research shows that um, a lot of stigma that people have towards affordable housing and homelessness in particular are people that have zero to no contact with people who are homeless, right? So there's a, a, a thesis called the contact thesis out there, that the more contact that you have – with people who are different from you, the less likely you're gonna have um, um, stigma and discrimination against those folks. So I think, in a sense, like I think politicians have to take a bit of a risk, and we've seen that sometimes here in Sacramento where people have built shelters and um, the pe surrounding community is very resistant, but after a couple of weeks and a couple of months, um, the attitudes can change, right? And I would argue it's because when you actually have an experience or interaction, it's not always negative, right? And it's a little bit more real, real uh, reality-based than not. So fortunately, we live in a very segregated society, and so we have a lot of these myths, and, and we perpetuate precisely about people that we just are afraid of more than anything else. So you mentioned then having our politicians take a little risk and potentially lose their seat the next time around, because that's what normally comes with that risk. How do we assure we're engaging them so they recognize that there is a significant portion of the population that cares about this and is less concerned about NIMBYism and is more just let's get people off the streets so we can do other things? Because I think that's the hardest thing with any politician. They're always worried about their next election. Right. And, but I also think that you talk to somebody at city council that will probably say that they see the same people over and over again okay. that, that speak at meetings. And they need to see a broader segment of folks. They need to see college students. They need to see people that work. They need to see just a broad segment of California that are concerned about this. Um, and know that we all care, not just the providers, not just the advocates, not just the real estate alliance or whatever, that we all have kind of um, something in this game. Thank you. Um, an interesting case is Tokyo, which does not have a problem with homeless individuals, mm -hmm. has grown by many millions of people over the last two decades, and has, actu and has absolutely zero developable land. Mm -hmm. So where are all these people living? Well, what Tokyo has done over the last two decades is that they tear down buildings and they build bigger buildings, mm -hmm. and people are living in those apartments. They also live in apartments that um, most Americans would not um, find quite credible. Uh, uh, the average size of an apartment for a family in Tokyo is 500 square feet. So there are, um, those are some of the, that, that is the case where you can make dramatically different social and value decisions and you can solve many problems by doing that. And one of the reasons that Tokyo does so much rebuilding is that there's very little local control in Tokyo about where you can place a larger building. Hi, I just, 
I know that there was a law that was recently passed for a for houses that require solar panels on there, do you mm. think that's going to mm. hurt the homeless population because housing would probably be more expensive after mm. that? Well, I mean, the builders will tell you yes, because if you add costs, they pass <coughs> on the cost, so housing will need to go up. The one thing that can mitigate that is when you require it, it becomes the rules of the game, and it creates, since we're doing market, based system, it creates a demand, which means the price of solar panels comes down. And so over time, the expense to produce houses with solar panels comes down. So that, I mean, and you get the benefit of reducing, you know, you get benefits that, may, that aren't direct around the housing cost, but they are broader social benefits. So those are ways that that plays both ways, right? I think, yeah, probably initially it's going to put a cost, that, an additional cost on home, on home construction that will mitigate over time because everybody will need to do it if that's true. I don't know the law. But when those types of laws pass, that's, that's typically how they'll play out. Okay, thank you. Now, as a... As someone who's trained in economics, you would hope that in many of these situations there would be market responses. Um, but we've seen that you can have dramatically increasing housing um, uh, values where economists tell you that you should see greatly expanding supply of housing, and we've mm -hmm. not seen that. It's lagged for the last 20 years by about 200,000 units uh, per year. Similarly, you have energy efficiency investments that make a lot of sense. There was a similar one where the uh, California Energy Commission implemented Part 15, which is requiring high efficiency lighting in office buildings. If you do the simple analytics and just spread it over 10 years, is it less expensive to put in LED lighting into your, into your building, or is it less expensive to put in re old incandescent lights? It is less expensive to put in LED lighting over that 10-year period, though it requires a larger upfront investment. The running costs are, are significantly lower. Even though economically you would say this is a great investment, um, it's, it, people have been fighting it tooth and nail. In regards to rapid rehousing, <coughs> um, are any of the barriers being eliminated? Like, um, say, somebody has a history of uh, having an eviction or a criminal background? Th that is very much a, a topic of discussion. What we are planning in interventions in creating a homeless court to enable people to um, uh, 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 expunge misdemeanors, reduce felony convictions down to misdemeanors, all of those constraints that can make it difficult for someone to, uh, um, to, to rent an apartment. Uh, another thing that we are working on is some of these models, when we've looked at it, that a really important aspect of rapid rehousing program is building up relationships with a landlord. Landlords, in some ways, having a tenant who has a rapid rehousing voucher is a great deal for a landlord because um, the, the government is paying for that rent. It gets paid every single day. But on the, on the flip side, a lot of these landlords don't chafe at the idea that they have to be inspected all, to, all the time by a, by a government agency. So building up those relationships, lowering those barriers can, can mean opening up an entire building, and that's something that we, we need to work more on. Yeah, and I also think that you know rapid rehousing, I think Chris kind of alluded to this, like 10 years ago was kind of the magic bullet that people thought would really address this, right? It's a great idea. We need to reduce the amount of time that people are spending on the street. If we can rapidly rehouse somebody, our family, very quickly, the evidence shows that it, it's a really um, great investment, right? Unfortunately, rapid rehousing, the effectiveness decreases in a tight rental market, and that landlords can be can scrutinize tenants uh, more so in a tight rental market right. because they know that there are other renters out there. Mm -hmm. And so the efficacy of rapid rehousing has been declining as housing markets have been getting tighter. So that, it's no That's why I was asking if yeah. it's being addressed because uh, you know when somebody has an eviction, whether it's their fault or no fault of their own uh, yeah. circumstances, um, it tends to really limit their ability to get into another unit. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great point. I 
I usually get a question about tiny homes. No tiny home questions today. <laughs> okay. There's always a question about Yes, that. tiny homes are a great idea. Do we have? They're, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, it's a good idea. Anything is a good idea. It's not a bad idea. Any, just one more question pot potentially from anybody? No, okay, well I just wanna thank, first of all, all of you for your time this evening in engaging in this conversation and to our wonderful panelists for taking the time to share with us their, their thoughts and um, we'll stick around um, after the, a little bit for, to, to kind of chat if you'd like to, but otherwise, um, welcome to Sac State Downtown and um, thank you for being here. Uh -huh.